Hello, my name is Steve Hammond and I represent the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Today we have the uh, privilege of uh, interviewing Mr. John Chenard. And uh, he was a Vietnam War veteran. He has quite a story to tell. But first, before we get into your military service, John, um, tell me when you were born and where you were born. I was born in Chicago Heights, Illinois in 1948. Hmm. Um, could you tell me about your parents? Uh, well, they're both dead now, but I, I had great parents. Uh, my dad was a barber his entire life. Uh, had a gigantic barber shop, 13 chairs at one time. And, uh, my mother was just a de dedicated housewife, and she was just a beautiful, fantastic woman. Hmm. Um, trying to think... Uh... Any brothers and sisters? I have an older sister and a younger brother. Hmm. And what do they do for a living? Uh, my older sister is retired. She's up here in the Grand Rapids area. Hmm. And my younger brother, he's down in Florida trying to survive. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, how was it like growing up in that area? It was good. It was good. Uh, many uh, activities and programs for kids growing up there. and. Uh, bought my first, second, and third house down there, and it was it was just good living, mm. good living. What? Uh, where'd you go to high school at? Crete Moni High School. Mm. How was that? Yeah, little redneck, little little town <laughs> high school. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> and it's still that way. Now you were born in '48, right? Yes. Okay. Now, when did you decide to go into the military? Were you drafted? I really had no choice. I was drafted. Okay. And I went in in uh, uh, 67. Mm -hmm. And it uh, didn't take long. The draft was held on January 1st, I believe, or December. Of what year? Uh, the, well, the, every year they had a, a lottery. Okay. And my, the number I drew for June 23rd was number <coughs> 8. So uh, I think it was the first of January they they did the draft draft, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in the army by February eighth, I believe it was. Okay, could you explain more about this lottery draft? Because a lot of people don't know about that. They drew numbers. They people who qualified to be drafted was drafted by the way the numbers came up versus their birth, date of birth. So what they had 365 balls in the basket and they draw one. The first one would be January 1. Second ball, regardless of what month or year or month it was, <clears throat> would be January 2. You know, I had February 8th, so it didn't take too long for them to get to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, where was your uh, basic training at? Fort Polk, Louisiana. Okay. How was that? How was the training back well, then? Well, it, it's a rude awakening from s civilian life to military life. Mm -hmm. But it was okay. It was okay. I took it down there in the spring, so it wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, me being ex-military, they told us years later in the mid-80s when I took my basic training that if this was wartime, they would cut from eight weeks to four weeks. Is that what they did with you? No. Okay. No, not at all. How long was basic training? Uh, eight weeks. Okay. Eight weeks. Okay, they must have changed it after that then. That's what they told us anyway. Okay. But anyway, um, your advanced training, uh, what did you do? Fort Polk, I was in infantry. <clears throat> okay. So you 11 Bravo? 11, 11 Bravo, yes. Okay. How was that? It was a little harder. Mm -hmm. A little bit more aggressive training. Mm -hmm. A little bit more... Uh, anti-enemy training, you know, <laughs> yeah. teach you how to eliminate the uh, the enemy in several different ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, could you describe that just briefly or? Oh, bayonet training. Uh, we fired 50 caliber machine guns. Mm -hmm. Not everybody gets a chance to fire a 50 caliber machine gun. No. Uh, oh, we do live hand grenades, uh, climbed up rope towers, through swamps with 
snakes and poisonous bugs. Oh yes, we're in Louisiana. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, did anybody get bitten? No. Okay. No snakes are afraid of us. It's just as much as we were them. And that's what I've heard. I've never, I've been down south, but I never lived down there, but my relatives and friends have always told me that too. Yeah, they they, they don't want to be, no human contact. Yeah. They run. What about gators? Were they down there? No. Too? Never saw a gator. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> about, this is still 68 or is it, or 67? Is it going to be, or is it close to 68 now? No, it's, it's still 67. Okay. Now after that, uh, you're, MOS training, military occupational specialty. After that training, where'd you go? I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for airborne training. Hmm. Can you tell us about that? Well, you learn how to jump out of a perfectly perfectly good airplane. And uh, I still wonder why I did that. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but uh, now they teach you all the facets of <coughs> learning how to jump out of a, a plane properly mm -hmm. with a static line. No free fall. How was that doing it for the first time? Uh, everybody had to get pushed out of the airplane. Okay, once you get up 1,500 feet and you're going along a couple hundred miles an hour, you, you look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And the guy behind you, he's just told to push you. And oh, you so go. wow! So everybody behind pushed each other. That's right. What about the last person? <laughs> yeah. Was it one of the? There was someone at the door to push them out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you were out, I never was airborne, but when you when you went out, when did you know when to pull the cord for your? No, you didn't. Oh, you didn't. You were hooked on with a static line. Okay. When you jumped out of the door, the static line would pull your chute out and open it for you. Okay. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So it's basically almost right away that yeah. your chute open and stuff. Yeah, you're flying about 1,500 feet, so mm -hmm. the, the chute opens very quickly and you're on the ground in five, six seconds. What, uh, has it ever been where there were some kind of mix-ups there that nobody's did or? No. Okay. No. Everything is, the chutes are all packed under strict supervision mm -hmm. and uh, no, everything is, nobody get gets hurt. If you don't roll when you hit the ground, you might sprain an ankle or something, but mm. they teach you how to land also. Oh. So the training was pretty good in airborne school. Oh, yeah. We had fun. Oh. We had fun. Uh, what after that, after your airborne training? Well, while I was in airborne school, they uh, approached me about ranger school because my uh, basic and AIT mm -hmm. uh, scores were so, so high. Uh, so I signed up for ranger. And I went through the ranger training program. That was 12 weeks at that time. Mm. And there you jumped out of helicopters at 15,000 feet. And there you, you free fall. Then you open up a halo chute. And uh, for the new people, they had an altimeter that they wore and they would start <clears> beeping <throat> when they got so low. And you, then that's your cue to open your chute. Uh, otherwise, the older guys, they just knew how knew how to do it and when to do it. They had that much experience so they could know. Oh, yeah. Wow. I've had about 100 jumps total. Mm -hmm. So I don't need an altimeter anymore. Okay. But I don't jump out of perfectly good helicopters or airplanes <laughs> anymore either. <laughs> wow, that's pretty nice. Um, so after your ranger training, uh, was that still Fort Benning? or? Uh, no, uh, that was all over. That was Panama, <clears throat> Costa Rica. Hmm. Uh, uh, Air Force Base in Florida. Uh, that was 45 years ago. I can't remember the name of the base. You're good. It's on the Panhandle. Probably either Tyndale or a Pen. I can't remember it, but it's there's a Navy Air Force Base right there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, how was the countries of Panama, Costa Rica? Did you get to see any of it, or no. did you get to interact with anybody there? No. We had, we had special camps down there, military reservations. And that's where we did all of our training and had no contact with the locals at all, none. You think that was good? Probably. Yeah. It w wouldn't interfere with our training. Yeah. So you're talking about 1968 now, pretty much? Yeah. Okay. 67. I'm still 67. Okay. Did you get to see the Panama Canal at all? No. Okay. No. How close were you, do you know? Probably uh, 75, 80 miles. Okay. 
Yeah, quite a ways actually. Yeah. So. All right. So after all that training, when did you get the orders to leave the country to go overseas? <laughs> when I was done with my <clears throat> ranger training. Okay. All right. And it, uh, ag well, let's backtrack. First of all, I was sent to Washington D.C., not overseas. Mm -hmm. But I was assigned to a, the first Ranger Battalion that went overseas every couple of weeks, went back and forth. Mm -hmm. And then you got picked for one of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, how was that when you were traveling with them when you first went to Vietnam? How did you feel? Nervous. You never know what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, you always heard uh, all about the terrible atrocities and the war stories from people coming back. Excuse me. But uh, it was a uh, it was a chilling experience because you didn't know what to expect really. Sure. Uh, we did notice the first thing we got off the plane: the heat. The heat was just <coughs> terrible, and the humidity. Mm -hmm. But we had we we went back and forth to do one specific mission. It wasn't a black op, or it wasn't anything like that. We were handpicked to go do one sp specific job, and that was it. When that job was done, we'd come back, come or come back to the base come back to the United States, go right back to uh, Fort McNair, U.S. Army Headquarters, and that's, that was my duty assignment. Mm -hmm. and that's in D.C., right? In D.C., yes. Okay. Now, could you tell me about those, what do you call it, those missions or whatever? They were just specific uh, search and seizure uh, missions. We were assigned to go extract POWs. Okay. American or, American. or South Vietnamese? No, uh, any, well, basically American. Okay. Uh, the uh, fighter pilots, they were flying over wherever they were dropping bombs. They had cameras going all the time. <clears throat> and they would pass over an area or close to an area that could have possibly been a POW camp. And another pilot would go by and take another picture and they decided, well, yeah, that probably is definitely a POW camp. So then they would stick our ranger squad go in there and determine whether it is or not and if it was if they could take control of it or go back and get more help there was no radio contact no radio contact at all well wow. we were out there on our own but we were trained for that mm -hmm. did you uh, run into the enemy at all very very seldom we ran into more villagers Common people, non-combatants, as they would call it, mm -hmm. and uh, we just tried to avoid everybody. Mm -hmm. Did you ever um, have to interact with any locals when you did that, or you just guys just went in and around them? We tried to avoid them. Okay. If there were, uh, if we actually were detected or intertwined, mm -hmm. our paths actually crossed. There, there are other ways that we rather not talk about that one. <laughs> no problem, no problem. So in other words, you just avoided them. Yes, we at avoided all costs. Them at all costs. Yes. Okay. How many each time you had a mission there? Did you get how many POWs did you get out on an average? Uh, on an average, about twenty. Oh, that's pretty good. About twenty, and that was on four different occasions. Mm -hmm. We brought back <clears throat> twenty. Twenty-eight, I think, was the most, and I think the least was. 21, huh. I think, yeah. Those are pretty good numbers. Yeah. So they were in these camps, right, yeah. these POW camps. So you would actually have to, would you sneak in or would you have to actually have a, a small firearms combat or? It wasn't a small firearms combat. We would uh, detect the camp. We would en encase the camp. We would... They have no contact. They did not know we were there. We were just watching their movements. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain time, specified time that we all agreed on, we all had. We were all in our position. We knew where all the enemy was. 
and we just shot them one by one. Mm -hmm. We knew exactly where they were. In 10 seconds, it was all over. And then you just went in and got them and out? We went in and got them out and started hoofing it back. Now, of course, I hear all kinds of stories, too, and the public sees all kinds of movies, too. Were they actually, what kind of cells were they in? Were they on in oh. bamboo-type things, or what were they in? Our, our POWs. Yes. Uh, they, they were very primitive. Most of them <clears> were <throat> taken over villages, and they were grass huts. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them were on, most of the POWs were on leaders, so they couldn't run off either way. Either had things around their necks or things around their ankles. Mm -hmm. And 50 foot cable, enough to hit the latrine, enough to, you know, to move, but that was it. There was no concrete cells. It was far from being a prison. Bamboo bars at all, none yes. of that stuff? Uh, made, oh, the, their perimeter fencing was made out of sticks. Okay. Sticks tied together. So was the bamboo stuff kind of Hollywood type stuff? Yeah. That we see. Okay. Uh, sticks, trees, branches, mm -hmm. leaves. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, well, I know. I'm not sure what I'm looking this. What I'm trying to say. Uh, Whatever the environment. There, there had. were no concrete walls. They right. were very primitive. Okay. Very primitive people. So when you took, when you you did your, took the guards out, we'll say, it was easy going there and, and getting them out. Yes, it was. Okay, very easy. Very easy. <clears throat> uh, the Americans, the POWs, when you saw them, I know that what their reaction would be, but were a lot of them abused? Were they, or can't you say, or? Malnutrition, more mal malnutrition and lack of medical. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't. I don't think any of them were really abused. They weren't beaten. Not tortured or nothing no. like that. No. Mm -hmm. No. Hmm. Uh, Could you tell me the reaction of the first ones that saw you? Oh, they were ec ec ecstatic. Just totally ecstatic. They knew who we were right away. They, there's such a different sound of the rifles we were using compared mm -hmm. to our enemy combatants. And they knew, they didn't even see us, and they knew we were there. Wow. Yeah. So would you have to identify yourself to them when you come no. up to them? No. Okay. They knew who we were. All right. Yeah. And that's good. What took you so long? <laughs> How long Shut was... up or we'll leave you. <laughs> <laughs> How long were some of them there? Were some of them there longer than others? Or? Yes, some were there longer than others. They traded a lot of people off throughout the, throughout the whole war. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, some of them died. Some of them died in custody. Uh, mm -hmm. But they were, they, were, they were alive. Their spirits weren't broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted to go home, oh. and we we brought them back. How far did you have to go before you got to the nearest base? About two hundred miles. Wow! And we did that all on foot. So did you have to carry some See, of them? Most of this was done in Laos. Okay. And uh, we were never in Laos. Hmm. So did you have to carry them at all, or get some a stretcher? Them, or? Some of them we did. We had to carry. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no stretchers or anything like that. They. Two people helping them walk them out. <clears throat> wow. Now, did you run into the enemy at all going back? Very seldom we ran into the enemy. We ran into more village people. Okay. Villagers, common people. And uh, how we did what we, what we had to do to to get to keep going. Sure, I understand. There was one time we ran into. No, we didn't run into. But uh, do you remember who Pol Pot was? Mm-mm. <laughs> He was a, uh, or the Cumer Rouge. That's I've heard of that, yeah. Okay, that's like a left-wing army of the North Vietnamese okay. army. Uh, renegade, guerrilla <coughs> mm -hmm. type, ta uh, type, type tactics. And the leader was Pol Pot. And our paths crossed their paths one time. Never had contact with them. No battle contact. But we knew they were there, but they didn't know we were there. Hmm. Uh, so we just laid low, waited for them to, to leave. Now, they're, they're an army of 150,000 people. And there the, the Viet six, Cong? Yeah. 
Okay. Or the Cumar Rouge. I can remember. And okay. uh, we were six. Mm. six you had people. that? Just six in one platoon? Six, six people in a squad. In a squad, six, okay. Six, seven, or eight people would go in oh. and extract these PO, POWs at a time. No more. Why was the six a good number to get them in and out? And how did people know that, that it would be so success, successful with six instead of like 15 our, or 20? Our training. Okay. Less number, less detected. Mm -hmm. uh, our cover would have been a lot better <clears throat> the lesser numbers you are mm -hmm. and we were trained to take out a lot of people and uh, didn't need any more mm. yeah you you, st anymore. you still average between 21 and 28 American POWs out of there Coming out. and <clears throat> we're and the, the six of us could take out 20 to 30 guards in just a few seconds because we knew where they all were Wow. Two o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. we knew where every one of them was and just pew, 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 one shot and take them out. Did you ever have to use any like uh, grenades or anti-tank weapons or anything no. like that? Just Nothing all like that. small arms? Oh, small arms. We carried them 14s <coughs> rather than 16s. They, they were more accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, muzzle, velo muzzle velocity was greater, more accurate. Uh, we used it more as like a sniper weapon. Sniper rifle. Right. Mm. We had twilight scopes. Mm, okay. Just that was something new. Tell me about the, or tell us about the twilight scopes. Well, you you could pick up heat signals <coughs> at night. You you look through the lens and it's it's green, mm. and you can. The the heat from the body people's body is warmer than the tree or the ground around around them, and you could see their outline, so you knew mm -hmm. exactly where they were. You could tell if they were taking a shower, they were sleeping. You could you could see it. You could, you could pick up the heat signal through grass huts. You could mm. see them sleeping there. Wow. So it was just aimed for that. And now, how did you know the grass huts that they were sleeping in compared to the POWs? Oh, the POWs were always out in the open. <coughs> mm. They were always out in the open. Could you tell us more about that? Well, they some some of them some of the pens that they had. They herded them in the things like pig pens. Some of the pens were had, had covers on them, but the sides were always open. Hmm. And the uh, people, the enemy, in the guard towers around, well, they really weren't guard towers, they were uh, <laughs> trees with platforms on them and mm -hmm. uh, very crude. But uh, they would, they, 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 they saw they could see the POWs at any <clears throat> time. There weren't any building. Hmm. Oh. So what? A, the kind of animals did you run any going there back that would be like hurtful to you? Like was there, was there cobras over there? Poisonous snakes? They were poisonous snakes, but they we never had any problem with snakes. Our biggest problem were, were leeches. If we had to walk through a creek or a river, you always came out full of leeches hmm. all over you. And you just walk through this creek, <coughs> waist waist deep for thirty seconds, and you come out and you had leeches all over you. You know, really terrible. But uh, spiders, a lot of spider bites, but nothing dead, nothing deadly. Hmm. Uh, big problem with wild boars. Wild boars would uh, detect you, and they would they'd come snooping, and if they felt threatened, they would they would charge you. Sharp teeth, sharp tusks? Tusks. Teeth. I'm pretty sure they had pretty good teeth. We never ran across any, but I've heard nightmare stories about people who have. Mm -hmm. And you got to get the boar, otherwise the boar is going to get you. Mm -hmm. Now, if, say, like, did you run any on, on your way to a POW camp that would give your position away at all? No. Okay. No. We didn't run into any boars. <clears throat> or I didn't. Mm -hmm. Other Other members of the the group did, but uh, I no, I never ran into any any boars. Well, oh. so 200 miles, you averaged between 21 and 28 POWs, just the six of you. Yes. How long did it take you to get back to an American base? Three to four weeks. Wow. Oh. What did you do for food and water? Uh, we were we learned how to scavenge. There's there's rice everywhere out there. Mm -hmm. Rice everywhere. So many good vegetable plants. Mm -hmm. It grows in the wild. We also had uh, uh, 
uh, Lerps, uh, <clears throat> some traded uh, meals in a squeeze packet to um, that they have. They call it something else now. Uh, I'm not sure what they call it now. Back then they called them Lerps, and uh, <coughs> we su we survived. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. Water? What'd you get it from the streams? Water was everywhere. Was it? Water was everywhere. Um, were there any plants that were actually not good for you that you ate from, or no? We <coughs> knew what plants we could eat from, but wild vegetables grew everywhere out there, and you just have to learn how to eat a sweet potato raw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what kind of vegetables besides a sweet potato were there? Uh, tomatoes. Really? Yeah. The 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 local people they grow. They grow everything that they eat, hmm. and uh, we could we could pilfer <laughs> pilfer their gardens. Well, you got to do what you got to do to survive, yeah. especially bringing POWs that yeah. many through. And I'm sure they were probably glad to get something to eat. Yeah, uh, determination and willpower was far more important than putting food in your stomach. Was it? They they. Oh, we did too. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times when we'd just eat one piece of fruit all day long, mm -hmm. but we just had the willpower to keep on going. Uh -huh. We're going to get back. Mm -hmm. We want to go home. Now, when you got them to a base, what was the reaction of the, the your commanding officers and NCOs at the base, and the reaction of your POWs when you first came onto the base? They were all <clears throat> very. They welcomed everybody with open arms. Uh, we were like a suicide squad. When once we left that base, they thought they'd never see us again. Mm. You know. Then a month later, here we come back with a whole bunch of people, and they, they were just very, very thankful. They rushed them right off to medical, mm -hmm. medical before they were even debriefed. Wow. We went in. We had to turn over our cameras. We took a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. And we had to turn over our cameras. We were debriefed. Then we got a chance to clean up and eat ourselves. Hmm. And we sometimes we had a chance to say goodbye to the POWs. Sometimes we didn't. Oh. Put us back on a C-130 and back to the States. So how much time did you have between each mission? Maybe a month, month and a half. Okay. So I had a 30-day leave hmm. every 30 days. Was it uh, enough for you to go to the next mission? Yeah, was it? Yeah, it was. Okay. Oh. Two weeks was out on our own. Two weeks were back at the base for a, a, not extensive training, but refreshing training, mm -hmm. refresher training. Sure. Now, did you have some of the same uh, uh, soldiers with you during the whole time, or or did you have different ones each time? People did come and go, but normally <clears throat> the the squad was made up of the same people. Okay. One person might leave, and then another one would join. But as a uh, general rule, there you went out there with more people that you've gone on missions before with than new people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <clears throat> and this 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 assignment was strictly voluntary. Okay. Strictly voluntary. You were brought to Washington D.C. and then they explained everything to you, and you could say yes or no. And you'd be surprised how many people said yes. Really? What made you decide to do this? Did you feel like you had to do it? Did you want to do it? Did you feel like uh, it was something you should do when you put on that uniform for the first time, or what? I really, that's a question I really don't think I could answer. I have always been helpful to other people that needed help. Hmm? I have been that way my entire life. And, uh, I just figured, boy, these people really need our help right now. Yeah. And they, our, gov <coughs> I, our government picked me to go do this, so I went. Yeah, sure. I have no regrets. But I was crazy when I was on these missions. You, you, you change. Your personality changes. You go in there as a young man. You come back as a, uh, a crazy person. You really do. Mm. Well, you've seen a lot of stuff normal people that just live regular lives don't see. Yeah. Yeah.
that, that, that that'll change anybody. Yeah. It, <clears throat> I I didn't I didn't come back as a drug user as an alcoholic. I don't use those for excuses. Mm -hmm. uh, this post traumatic stress syndrome. I'm sorry, but I just I'm old school. I just don't have pity for those people. I don't. They're just using that as an excuse because they saw something that that wasn't pretty. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's war. Yeah. That's war. And uh, they didn't have any PTSD when we came back. We weren't even welcomed with with bands or uh, right. You know, we, we were booed. We had bricks and bottles and <clears throat> stuff thrown at us. Mm -hmm. Well, we can we can go over that a little bit later. Okay. I want to back it up <laughs> a little bit more. Okay. Um, <laughs> you said they found out the camps they were with when they were dropping bombs. Well, when they were evacuating the area, when they were after they succeeded with, the, with their mission, they okay. were on, they were hightailing it out of there. Okay. But they had uh, cameras going on the bottom of their planes all the time. Okay. And uh, just reconnaissance. That's all. Okay. And they would put together these series of pictures, and they determined, well, maybe that could be a POW camp. Now, when you guys got your mission, did anybody have a map at all, or did you guys just go? Oh no, we were all briefed back at the the Army War College mm -hmm. at Fort Fort McNair. <clears throat> we uh, we knew what path we were basically going to take, what we were going to take with us, how far away it was, and uh, every time they were right, they were right. But we knew all that before we even left. Okay, so you know pretty much which way to go, what direction to go in. Yeah. Okay. We knew where the swamps, the creeks, the rivers, the, okay. the, the villages, we knew all that. So basically they just assigned you to one camp to go to? Yes. Okay, did they assign, if you even know this, did they assign other groups to different camps? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes, did. did you ever run into any other Americans that no. were going to that? No. Okay, so they pretty much separated as much as they could from different areas to go to. That's yes. very smart. Yeah. Thinking there. Um, okay. Our path never crossed. Okay. Now, did you any of you ever get hurt, injured, or anything, or wounded in action, going to and from any of you six that was going to get these POWs? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I got shot several times. Okay. I mean, do you want to say anything about it, or you don't want to say anything? Well. I'm still here. I just have a couple extra holes in my body, <laughs> and uh, luckily enough, nothing hit vital organs. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, when we came under fire, we were far enough away from the from the sniper or the enemy combatant to uh, By the time the rounds hit us, the velocity had been cut in half. Okay, so it just went. It just went into us and buried itself in the muscle. Hmm. But uh, I, I got, uh, I got several holes, different new holes in my body, but nothing serious. Now, <clears throat> you said the bullets were still in you, right? I still have fragments. Okay. In me. Um, did you have to have surgery right away when you got to the ba back no. to the base, or just? No. If, if it wasn't <clears throat> life threatening. They'd put a Band-Aid on it and take care of us at Walter Reed Army Hospital. When okay, got back. when you got back? Okay, yeah. I see. And obviously it wasn't life-threatening to you. No. Was any of the other six life-threatening? or? Well, we did lose one of our people one, on one occasion. Did you? And uh, another <coughs> one we had to carry out. Okay. Along with the POWs? Along with the POWs. So that left just five of you to take them? Uh, actually, there were seven of us on that that one there, eight of us all together. Okay. Uh, depending on where we we're going and where we were traveling, <coughs> what type of terrain we were traversing, depending whether it was six, seven, or eight. Oh. It's quite a mission. Yeah. I'm about, all together, do you have a rough idea? First of all, how many times did you go in and out of these POW camps? I went in and out six times. Six times. So then, uh, do you have like an average how many you got out all together, you think? 
Over 100, probably. I would say right around 100. Yeah. I don't know for sure. I don't remember. Yeah, that's fine. I, I go to a reunion every year mm -hmm. down in Indianapolis. Oh, wow. But so many of us are dying, and so many of them are dying. Right. Uh, I don't even keep track. Yeah. I, I just I don't, don't know. Plus, I'm so old, Alzheimer's, I think, is setting in because I can't remember anything now. <laughs> well, you're remembering pretty good now, so I don't think you have Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, okay. <clears throat> so, you went back and forth to Vietnam about six different six, times? Six different times over a period of 14 months. Okay, wow. So, basically, you're looking at 1969 pretty much right now. Uh, 68 and 69, yes. Okay, yep. Yeah. And, of course... As a lot of people know, 69 was the height of the war, mm -hmm. or 68, excuse me, not 69, okay. 68 was, where we had the most troops over there and we had the most casualties too, and stuff like that too. Um, <clears throat> when they, when you guys got the POWs to the to the American bases or camps or wherever you went to, were they pretty much taken back to the States after they were... After they were checked out medically mm -hmm. and after they were debriefed, Okay. yes, they came back to the States. And then they were probably discharged from there if they wanted to, or? I don't know what happened to them after that. Okay. Some of them were under longer uh, military obligation. Sure. Some of them may have expired or sure. weren't past their expiration date. Sure. Now, were these enlisted guys or officers that you pulled out? They were out? both. Both? Okay. They were both. Most of the enlisted were <clears throat> ground troops. Most okay. of the officers were... Uh, pilots? Pilots. For the uh, helicopter or, or both, like, both. Yeah, we lost a hell, a lot of helicopters over there. Yeah, I think I still read stories today of of a lot of helicopter crews and pilots that are still unaccounted for. They're still unaccounted for. Yeah. So, well, I'm going to say this during this whole. I period. I would love to be able to go back there. Okay. And traverse some of these paths that I took mm -hmm. just to just to help locate. Sure. I'm going to say this throughout this whole interview here, John. Thank you very much for all you've done. I mean, that's fantastic, this story even so far. And <laughs> we got more time to go. I was crazy back then. I was. Well, it doesn't sound like you're crazy because you got Americans back home yeah. from a war that wasn't very popular and a war that a lot of young men were killed unnecessary. Yeah. It really does. And, you know... Thank you very much. This was the first war that we <clears throat> were really in where politics yep. had a major major factor. Not the sake of winning the war. Right. Politics played played too much and, of it. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit here too. Okay. Okay. All right, so your last time you were over there, did you do anything after that over in Nam? No. That was it. That was it. Okay. Uh, last time I came back, I was injured. I got shot three times. Uh, nothing life-threatening, but needed some reconstructive surgery. Okay. And they took care of that at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Okay. And then they released me to Fort Myer, Virginia. Okay. It's right across the river from Fort McNair. But I was... Uh, Still in an infantry capacity, but more of a honor guard status. Hmm. Okay. So, so <clears throat> back to Vietnam. Okay. Have you ever been in the cities like Hue or Saigon or any of those? Nope. Never had time. Never had time. Never, never around any of those cities. Okay. Uh, never had time. Okay. We were dropped off there. And the next day we were out on our mission and we came back and sometimes we were gone the same day. Wow. Yeah. So then, uh, <clears throat> basically, when you, uh, um, by, by 69, of course, we had a new president, Richard Nixon, yes. of course, you know. Did you guys ever hear anything about Go, anything going on in the States when you're over there? No. We, all, all we really knew was, uh, well, what we knew when 
between the trips going back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did know that uh, Westmoreland lost the uh, <coughs> command and uh, Crichton Abrams mm -hmm. took over. Right. Uh, but that was about it. How did you feel about Westmoreland being relieved of command? Actually, he was he was commander for troops in Vietnam for four years, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was a mistake mm -hmm. changing him from a a, a, a long term combat warrior mm -hmm. to a stateside uh, non combat general. Right, desk job, in other words. Yeah. Now, some Vietnam vets they they don't think too highly of them, of him. They always call them waste more men. That's no, what they called him. No. So, I I never looked at it that way. Okay. I never looked at it that way at all. I was I was just curious about okay, half of them said this, half of them said that, but it's the same with other veterans I've I've talked to of high generals like World War II vets say the mm -hmm. same thing about their high admirals and generals too, and the same with. Uh, uh, later, later ones too, like Afghanistan and Iraq and all that stuff. But I look at things a little differently. It was a time of war. We needed things to get done. People had to do it. People were going to get lost. Now, one question too. You don't have to answer this, okay. but I always ask Vietnam vets this: Did you ever have any civilian, especially children, come up to you that had bombs on them? No. Okay. All right. No. I'm sure you probably heard all kinds of stories. Sure. Yeah. So, but uh, anyway, thank you for answering that. Okay. That's that's a, that's a hard question that I ask Vietnam vets, but I always ask because some will say they'll they'll tell me a little bit, and others won't. There's a second half to that. No, though. Sure. Because uh, when we were <clears throat> on a mission and we came across any friend any friendly people, sure. non-combatants, mm -hmm. uh, they were dead when we left. Well, like I said, with the stories in history books and veterans have telling me no. and other people, uh, you probably wouldn't have been out of there alive. Yeah, well, that's if, true. If you would have, some soldiers that's never true. came back that, that hugged the children. Yeah. But anyway, we'll leave that alone okay. right now. But thank you very much for your honesty. Okay. okay. All right, <clears throat> now, so you came back to the States, what, in 70, 71? 71. 71. Uh, you no, mentioned... No, 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 70. 70. 70. Okay. Yes. So when you came back, you were headed back to D.C., right? Yes. Okay. When you came back to the States, did you stop off in California, or... No. Just straight? Okay. Yeah, straight over. Of course, you probably had some stops, obviously, to fill up fuel and stuff. Two. Just to fill up the bird. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah, we didn't have uh, the, the supersonic jets we do now. We would fly straight over the... But, yeah. So anyway, um, you mentioned earlier about how you were treated. Stuff being thrown at you. Where was this at? Well, one of them was... One of our missions coming back, we did stop at Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And we were pelted with all kind of... Anything that could be thrown. Yeah. Most mostly it was uh, glass bottles, mm. uh, cans that were still full and not had been opened, uh, rocks, stones. Were you guys anything. in? Were you guys in uniform? Is that how we they were, could tell? We were still in our in our combat fatigues. Okay. And they were. I'm sorry. Did they did was that at the airport or was the, the, that? No, this was at the uh, Fort Lewis, Washington airstrip. Airstrip. Oh, this okay. was uh, they unloaded right right near the fence. Mm -hmm. So anybody that came in, they were within stone's throw of the fence. And so, didn't the security of the base try to stop them, or they they would go up to the, up up to the fence, but they wouldn't they wouldn't go on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. they, they they would just sit there and taunt them. Did anybody safe. get hurt with the glass no. bottles or rocks or whatever? Somebody got a couple. Bumps on the head, maybe a stitch or two, but nobody really got hurt. So basically, you guys pretty much ignored it as much as you can. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just turned our backs on them. Probably the best way. Yeah. Right there. 
luckily <clears throat> we, we didn't have uh, rifles with live ammunition because it probably would have shot them too. <laughs> well, the thing about that is they don't have the real story. They only go on by what they saw in the news and what they've been hearing. So they they basically had a prejudice against you, unfortunately. They had a prejudice against anybody that was in any military. Yep. I mean, if I was old enough back then, if I wore a uniform, they'd probably throw rocks at me, even if I'd been to Vietnam. Yeah. You know, and that's, I know that's a sign of the times. It's gotten better, yeah, but it's, it's no answer. still no excuse for this country to do that, no matter who they are. Yeah. That's how I've always felt, and I was really young during that well, time. But look at how they what they did the, during this past presidential election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's I know. Well, I know. And this was forty years ago, forty-five years ago. You know, it's 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 just terrible. It, it really is. I don't know where some of these people get their right. And that for everybody to know right now, for future use, the past presidential election was between Hillary Clinton and. Uh, Donald Trump, with Donald Trump, of course, winning. And that's all we're going to say about that. That's for future use for people that listen to this uh, uh, interview. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Can I put in my two cents on that one? No, I'll, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. This is the, okay. this is the United States of America. Yeah, you, okay. <laughs> but we, I'm just letting people know, so, you know, the time frame and stuff like that, too. But you are right. People get, uh, what do you and think about These are about educated this? people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Anyway, so you come back to the States, and then uh, did you want to continue with the Army, or were you done with it? or I was going to be done with it, but I had two years of college under my belt. Okay. I was a half a credit down in the end of my second semester, mm, okay. second year, second semester. That's why I was drafted. Okay. And the Army came out with this program. For every year that you extend, we'll give you a year's college education. Oh, wow. So uh, I took that first year. Hmm. I'm in Washington, D.C. Now I'm at, oh, I'm in Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Now I'm at uh, Fort Myer, Virginia. And I can go to Northern Virginia Community College or University of Maryland in College Park. So I extended for a year. The Army gave me the time off to go to school. And yet I could still carry out my Army duties. Mm -hmm. And uh, I extended a second year and got my degree. Oh. And where did you go to school at? Uni or University of Maryland, College Park campus. Okay. Um, that's basically the Terrapins, right? Their yeah. name? Okay. Yeah. yeah. How was it like there? It was, I, I thought it was fine. I thought it was just great. Okay. Nope. I thought it was just great. I was couple years older than everybody else there, but uh -huh. sure. everything worked out just fine. Um, what was your major? What'd you, what was your degree? I got a degree in business accounting and management. Okay. The worst thing I could have ever done. <laughs> Why is that? Because in 72, 73, and 74, the, the personal computer came about. Mm. And they didn't need a, a, a uh, degreed accountant anymore. They just needed a computer operator with bookkeeping experience okay. because the computer would categorize and keep all the records. Okay. I got out and I did work for Sheraton Corporation mm -hmm. as a hotel auditor. I would travel around and audit franchise hotels. Mm -hmm. But that lasted a year. Then they didn't need me anymore. Wow. Now they're all the hotels are setting up satellite dishes <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, like I said Bookkeepers could take care of everything. They didn't need an accountant. So let's let's back up just a little bit. Okay. Before the war, before you went and drafted, were you going to Maryland then, or was it? No, no. I was going to a uh, uh, college in uh, Illinois. Okay. What was the name of the college? Prairie State College. Okay, Prairie State. And you were half a credit shy of two years. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd have had the extra half a credit, I wouldn't have been drafted. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, that. that in terms of stay in school? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a joke. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, so then when you got out, you were still in the military when you went to the University of Maryland? Yes. Okay. Now, of course we've heard all the college protests and stuff. Were they still protesting against the war when you were there? Not there, anyway. Really? Not there. Oh. 
Hmm. They were they were protesting a lot of other places, but I didn't see any of it at uh, University University of Maryland. Um, did they treat you any different because you were a veteran, the professors or the students? No, no, not really. really. Hmm. Uh, I was considered the old person in the class, mm -hmm. but no, not not really. Nobody. Uh, Nobody called you any names or anything. No. That's good. Yeah. I'm really impressed with I'll I'll be a Terrapin fan for a little bit for that one. <laughs> even though I'm a big Michigan State fan. Oh. <laughs> okay. No, uh I wasn't treated any any differently. Oh that's 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 good to hear. I'm I'm really there, glad to hear there that. There is so much military all around Washington D C. Mm hmm. Uh all five services have major installations. <clears throat> just around Washington and so much of their support live and just that, around Washington. Uh, nobody's going to badmouth any any uh, military military around Washington. So obviously they had an effect of where it was at. Oh yes. Pretty much. Yes. Not like some places like out in California or even where the unfortunate incident happened with the National Guard at Kent State there in Ohio. Yeah. I remember that. And they even had some here in Michigan at MSU and U of M and even up to Fair State where my brother went to school yeah. at the ROTC buildings and stuff like that. But um, anyway, that's that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm sure a lot of people are glad to hear that too. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as Maryland goes, by the way, where is University of Maryland at? College Park. And where's that at? Uh, northeast. Northeast. Uh... Washington D.C. Okay, all right. I've been to Maryland many times, but I've never been yeah. by that area for some Northeast reason. Quadrant. Okay, been to D.C. many times too, but I've never. D uh, D.C.'s set out or set up like Grand Rapids, Northeast, Northwest. Yep. Yeah. So. Same thing. All right. As far as uh, um, of course, uh, medal and service awards. You wanted you you said you earned a silver star. You like, tell me how you earned that. I can't just say. Really can't. That's fine. We really can't discuss that. Same with the bronze stars, right? You're in three bronze stars. Yes. Same thing? Okay. I, actually, uh, all my awards don't say what I did and where I did it at. Okay. It's just for <clears throat> uh, services rendered in uh, Southeast Asia. Understandable. And congratulations. Thank you for them, too. You were well deserved. Thank you. And, of course, four Purple Hearts. Um, you mentioned a couple of them. Um, it's up to you if you want to talk about that. Yeah. Got shot in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Got shot in my ankle. Got shot in my knee. Took one in the calf. Two in the two in the back. One hit my spinal cord. One in the shoulder. One here and one in my chest over here. Mm. The the one that hit you in your mouth. Uh, that's not life threatening. No, it didn't enter anything except my mouth cavity, but it did break off all my teeth at one time. So you had, did you have the bullet in your mouth, was it, or? Uh, no, it wedged itself between two teeth. Okay. And there was no place for the teeth to go. Mm -hmm. So they just went sideways and broke them all off at gum level. The The bullet ricocheted, ricochet, ricocheted up, it hit my jaw right here, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> Same thing, went between two teeth, no place to go, broke all the teeth off but one, and uh, stopped its forward momentum at that point. Now, did you have, to re have reconstructive surgery on your mouth or just? Nothing, reconstruct nothing reconstructed, just had to pull out all the roots and give me a false teeth. Okay. But they took care of all that and they still take care of all that. Oh, really? That's yes. good. Yeah. You mentioned uh, your spinal. Or did it, that one I have big problems with now. Okay. It took many, many years to catch up with me, but okay. I'm having problems with that now. Okay. doesn't seem like you do because you, you uh, work pretty good and stuff, but... As long as I stay active, it's okay, but as soon as I stop... You feel it? I feel it, yes. Okay. And then your shoulders, you said, too? Yeah. And then your ankle, you still feel them, too? I feel the one in my knee, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but the, the rest of them don't bother me at all. The spinal cord one does, uh, the one in my right knee, that 
there again, 40 years later, it's starting to... Right. I had an injury that wasn't really taken care of mm. good oh. 45 years ago. So. I've heard that a lot. Even World War II and Korean vets say the same thing, that their injuries catch up to them 40, sometimes yeah. 50 years later. Yeah. You know, like, wow, of course, technology now is obviously much different oh. than yeah, this, even this the Vietnam War. This is the back one that bothers me. Okay. Okay, yeah. You want us to stop for a minute, or are you no, no, good? No, fine. Just got to reposition myself a little. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> obviously, good conduct medal. Well deserved. Uh, your special duties were assistant army aviator, uh, pathfinder. I, that's what the award is. I was an avi aviation crew member. Okay. <clears throat> that's, I was part of a helicopter crew. Okay. And you earned your combat infantry badge? Yes. Congratulations. That's a very hard badge to earn. Yes. Got to be in combat. They don't mm -hmm. just hand those things out. They don't even hand them out anymore. No, I, I know. I'm surprised. And that's too bad. I have, I have some friends of mine that are Vietnam vets that I served in the National Guard that have that too. And yeah. I was very proud to stand next to them and, and dress <laughs> greens or dress blues in the Air, Air Army or Air Guard and stuff mm -hmm. like that too. And Believe it or not, when we have an inspection by uh, like lieutenant colonel or full bird colonels, yeah. They look at their medals. Say they say thank you very much for what you did in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and that's very good. And some of them officers like that didn't even go to Vietnam, or got in after Vietnam. So yeah. I have a <clears throat> very good friend that retired as a full bird colonel, and uh, I still address him as sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Obviously, you earned the National Defense Medal. You're in the 82nd Airborne. Yes. Okay. How does that does that make you feel proud, or or doesn't do anything for you that you were in the 82nd Airborne? Well, most Rangers are go through 82nd Airborne, not 101st. Uh huh. Most Rangers are 82nd. Uh, it it was just another duty station, duty assignment. That's how I got my Airborne. Uh. Nothing to brag about, but nothing to be ashamed about. Yeah. It's just a, a stepping stone in my ladder. Yeah. That's all it was. Hmm. I mean, those are those are units that not the average service mem member no, belong they, to. No, they have to be airborne. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I look more at that orange ranger tab mm -hmm. being more, oh, okay. more important to me than the 82nd Airborne. And why is that? There aren't that many rangers. Okay. Well, there's a lot of airborne. There's a lot of airborne, but they didn't go ranger. Mm. And of course, you earned your Southeast Asia Campaign Medal and your Republic of Vietnam Medal. Yes. And then you showed me a patch earlier of the Washington Monument with a sword by it. Military District of Washington. Could you tell us about that a little bit? Well, when I came back, I was assigned to Fort uh, Myer, Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's part of the Military District of Washington. Mm -hmm. All Army that's... <clears throat> that's in the military around the Washington area wear that patch as their own patch. And you told me that you're very proud of that. Why? I was in a unit that very, very few people have ever been, been in. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but like I said, I walked the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier mm -hmm. for three months. And I have a patch, I have a badge that's a tomb guard patch. It's mm -hmm. made out of sterling silver. And do you know that less tomb guard patches have been handed out than patches that have given to the astronauts that have gone up in space? Actually, to be honest with you, with me, that doesn't surprise me. Okay. But the people that would be viewing this interview, it would. There have been less tomb guard patches or medals awarded than patches for going into outer space. Wow. So. I know it's quite a, uh, not just an honor, but a, quite a lot of uh, restrictions you have to follow. Oh, yeah. For, oh. for that, because for obvious reasons, because it's when, very sacred. When I did it, it wasn't as sacred, or it was sacred, but not as many restrictions. Right. But ever since they identified the remains of the Vietnam unknown, mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I just look at that whole system a little bit different now. Sure. So you are you, are you saying that you didn't want them to identify, or, or I didn't want them to open up that okay. that tomb mm -hmm. and uh, do a DNA. I didn't want. It. I was against that. Hmm. Why is that? He, oh, he was part of. He was the, the selected Vietnam unknown, mm -hmm. and he should have left it, left it that way. Mm -hmm. Technology caught up with the times. The times didn't catch up with the technology. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I just don't <clears throat> think. They should have done that. I don't think they should have done it because now we don't have a Vietnam unknown, but we got a, a known from all the other wars, mm. and we'll probably never have another unknown. Hmm. See, I thought they had another unknown in there, but he was the only one. Oh, they had unknowns from World War One, right. Korea. Mm -hmm. I knew but that. They have a couple of different grave sites. It's not all one tomb. Okay, but see, I thought there was another Vietnam unknown at the tomb. I I don't think so. I don't know. Okay, sure. Don't, don't quote me on this. Yeah, I don't. I don't know myself. To be honest with you, I'd have to look that up. Sure, I've been to the tomb many times and stuff. But um, so you were the sentinel of the tomb, the unknown soldier, the assistant yes. commander for the second relief. Yes. Uh, just go ahead and tell me about that. Well, I was, I was handpicked for that position also. Mm -hmm. Uh, you go through an extensive training period before they even put you out on the mat. Mm -hmm. And uh, most uh, honorable, you're guarding the most honorable, sacred thing that our all the military, all the military, very military uh, forces look as sacred. Sure, that is sacred. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, uh, that's just how I, I looked at it. No, I mean, it's, that's good. I mean, a lot of people look at it that way. And You were also a, a member of the Army drill team for three months? Yes. What's that about? Uh, that's just a lot of uh, performance, <coughs> uh, gun rifles, showmanship, tossing mm -hmm. the guns around, flipping them, mm -hmm. unison, everybody doing thing in perfect unison, or the ripple effect. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But that, that was fun. We traveled a lot with that. They did a lot of presentations, different places, football games, basketball sure. games. Yeah. Well, that's still quite an honor to do that, really. And you were the honor guard at Fort Myer, too, right? Yeah. Okay, what's that like? Well, <clears throat> everything that I just described, the uh, tomb, the drill team, that's all part of the honor guard. Company Does it? Okay, Fort Myer. same thing, yeah. Same okay. Thing. Oh, that's pretty neat. Cool. All right. I, I was one of the uh, few infantry personnel that still rode a horse. I was what? in the caisson platoon for three months. Okay. And what's that all about? They're they're the white horse squad or the black horse squad that carry that pulls the caisson with the casket and the flag on the the flag draped casket mm -hmm. for burials in Arlington National Cemetery. Oh. Hmm. And I walked. I rode one of those horses. Wow! So I was part of the cavalry, you know. Sure was. I had a very, very, uh, very nice military career. You but sure I, did, and I want to thank you for it again. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, they they really didn't want me to get out, but no, I I had to go. Did you? What? Yeah. You, it was one of those things where it's time to go. Yes. Yeah. It was time for me to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. We'll, we'll back up later on a few other things, but right now I want to bring you up to the present time. So when you got out of the military, what did you do? Well, I went to work for Sheridan Corporation because I had that degree in accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, that lasted a year, and uh, Sheridan told me months in advance, look, we're, we're going to lay you off because we don't need this position anymore. You've been... Uh, been been replaced by electronics, and back then, uh, a computer <clears throat> needed a whole room with air conditioned floors to to, to stay. Oh the yeah, key punch operators. But it was the start. Sure, it was the start. Yep. So I uh, I 
went to operating engineer school. Uh, became be, became a crane operator and uh, did that for 40 years and retired. What did you do as a crane operator? Was it part of construction? or Construction. Was it... I would hang steel, lift concrete. One of those big tall things that you see? Well, that was the second 20. <clears throat> the first 20 years was in a big hydro crane. They're portable mm -hmm. and you can set them up at, at any job, job site. Mm. Uh, set them up on a daily basis. Uh, the second 20, I went tower crane. Mm -hmm. Those are the big ones that go straight up. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I did that for the second 20. Mm -hmm. More money. The higher up you got, you got more money for every five floors you went up. It's almost like more combat pay almost. Yeah, I like working for $100 an hour. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. I don't blame you any. That was nice. It so made life very comfortable for me. So obviously you didn't have no fear of heights. No. Well, I jumped out of airplanes. <laughs> Perfectly good airplanes. I'm afraid of a crane that's a three, four hundred feet tall? No. <laughs> so it fit right in. Yes. Now, did you ever get married? Yes. Okay. You have any children? Yes, I have three girls. Okay. Does that tell me about them? Uh... They're scattered all over the country right now. Okay. I <laughs> got one in New York, one in Florida, one in LA. You certainly do. Yeah. yeah they they're all professionals. Hmm. And uh, they're all doing well. And I talk to them, see them all the time. Oh. Um. My my wife passed back in 1990. Oh, sorry to hear so that. I had. The